Thank you for joining us today for this installment of our Generation Speaker Series. Our guest today really needs no introduction in the community of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. The Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh has been around for 40 years. This year is our 40 year anniversary. Our guest today was the director of the longest tenure, Linda Hurwitz. And in all the work that we do at the Holocaust Center now, we stand on her shoulders. So it is a real pleasure and honor to have her with us today to tell the story of her parents, both of whom were Holocaust survivors. Um, Linda, I'm not going to give you any more of an introduction because everything will come out in our conversation today. Thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, Lauren, to share my parents' story. I'm proud and inspired by my parents and all the Holocaust survivors that I've been honored to know in my life. I'm going to start off by talking about my mother's story, and then when she meets my father, I will weave his story into it to some extent. I know a lot more about my mother's story because she was willing to speak about it, and my father, not as much. Uh, my mother, Irene Vinograd, was born in Lodge, Poland, October 1st, 1921. She was the first daughter of a middle upper middle class family to Arnold and Losha Winograd. My grandfather Arnold was the oldest of seven children. My grandmother Losha, after whom I'm named, was one of eight children. My mother was very close to her grandparents, her great grandparents. She was very beloved and had a very lovely, lovely childhood and teenage years in Lodz, Poland. Lodz is the second largest city of Jews in Poland. It's closest to the border of Germany. So my mother was actually fluent in German as well, which was this, the second language she studied, and that was very helpful to her later on in the war. In her childhood, as I said, she was part of a very big family, and a family that were more secular Jews. They were socialist Bundists. They were not religious, but her grandparents and her great-grandparents were more religious, but she was not raised with a religious upbringing because her father believed that if you are a good ethical person, that that is what is most important in life, to live your life with a sense of dignity, with a sense of treat others as you'd like to be treated and all else is commentary. It was during a time of enlightenment in Poland. And even though she had this um, wonderful, supportive, big family, she was sent to a Polish school and had Polish friends as well as her Jewish family and her Jewish friends. She had obviously many aunts and uncles and cousins. She shared many stories about her grandparents and her grandmothers especially. She'd say how the grandmother who was the mother of eight children would be stirring a pot of soup in one hand. She would have a book and in the other hand, she'd be making the soup and she'd say to her granddaughter, to my mother, you know, education's important. Being a mother's important. Being a wife is important, that there's so much responsibility and so many challenges in life. But my mother um, loved being with her family and my mother was very close to her father and her father's side of the family, even more so than her mother's. She played with her cousins. She had her friends. Her parents had, were part of um, a family business before the uh, 1929 Depression where they distributed newspapers and magazines to kiosks throughout Poland. And everybody read many magazines and many newspapers. So it was a very successful business. Her father was the bookkeeper, the accountant. And my mother had that same talent with numbers later on. Um, I'll tell you, she worked for H&R Block, but she, my mother was talented in many ways. She could have been 
a gymnast. She could have been an accountant. She could have been a writer. My mother is one of the most brilliant people I've ever known. Um, if they had valedictorian, she would have been the valedictorian of her school. She skipped first grade and was put into school in second grade and kept up beautifully with everyone. She loved sports, like I say. In the, summer, in the winter, they were in the lodge in the big city, and she went to the Polish school. In the summers, they would go to the, camp, to the country, and she would go hiking, and she would go kayaking. She was on her high school volleyball team, which beat Germany right before the war broke out. She shared a lot of anecdotes of growing up with the family, going to the mountains in the summer when it was hot, similar to people here going to the Poconos or the mountains because there wasn't air conditioning. And during the school year, she loved her studies and was very successful with her academics. She did share a couple of experiences of anti-Semitism in the 30s. Mostly she felt very comfortable and did not experience much anti-Semitism. But being in a Polish school, there were a couple incidences where a teacher one time when she was very smart and answered some questions, my mother did not look particularly Jewish. She had sort of a, uh, she had a face that was not a typically Jewish looking face with blue eyes and dark hair. And with the name Winograd, the teachers were not always sure what her background was. Her grandparents actually came from Berdachev, Russia, to Poland. Poland invited Jews to come because they wanted a thriving middle class. And in addition to the thriving business that the family had with newspapers and magazines, her own father and mother also had a women's wear store in Ludge, Poland as well. And her mother would go and help out there, although she said really her mother loved playing cards with her sisters and her friends and family gatherings and being together was uh, very important. And they talked about politics and music and literature and art and just everything. She already had in her family women who were, who were definitely educated. And when she was in high school, as I said, she was, she did very well. And she also was industrious. She tutored other students. She had a summer job working as an accountant, one of her friends, father's businesses. And in 1938, she was fortunate enough to go to Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, and was one of a limited number, they had a quota of Jewish students who had the opportunity to have at least one year of college before the war broke out. Now, during that year of 38 at college, she really started to see the anti-Semitism that, that was occurring across the border in Germany, rolling into Poland a little bit as well. At the university, the, they made the Jewish students sit on benches in the back of the classrooms, and the non-Jewish students would push them off or make them stand, saying they shouldn't have a right to even be at the university. And so she started experiencing more anti-Semitism that year of 38 to 39 at college. In high school, except for the teacher saying, oh, you can't be Jewish and be that smart, and one other field trip that she went on where Christian anti-Semitism, where there were saying to the class that the Jews killed Christ. Um, and they showed this little crypt and said, that's the baby of a Christian child that the Jews bleed in order to have their blood for Passover for the matzah, which is called the blood libel, which sadly was this total misunderstanding of Jewish practice, which really forbids Jews who are kosher to have the blood of animals and asks us to salt the, the food that we eat and not have blood, but the blood libel twists that and says the Jews drink blood for Passover and that they kill Christian children to get the blood. And this is part of the source of anti-Semitism that existed in Poland and in Russia. If you read in 1911, there was an incident where a Jewish was accused of this, which of course was totally false. But sadly, these misunderstandings were part of the Christian anti-Semitism that existed in, in Europe. Um, so this year when my mother was in um, 
college. She had a very good year, but that summer of 38, she wasn't sure if she wanted to go back because of this anti-Semitism. And her mother said, don't let the anti-Semitism keep you from getting an education. So the summer of 39, she planned to go back to college. But of course, September 1, 1940, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland with the Blitzkrieg and brought the anti-Jewish laws to Poland. The 10,000 leaders in Poland fled. And by January of 1940, all the Jews were being ghettoized. And with Lodz being the closest city to the German border, the Lippmannstadt ghetto, which is what they called the Ludge ghetto, became one of the biggest, the second biggest after Warsaw, the second biggest ghetto. And the city was completely cut off from the non-Jews who had been friends and who had been acquaintances and who had shopped at her parents' store and so forth. So my mother was ghettoized along with her, her whole family in the Ludge ghetto. But right before that happened, between the attack on Poland and the ghettoization, my mother's good friend said to my mother, you should come with me and go to Warsaw because Jews were trying to, to head east away from where the Nazis were entering Poland. So my mother went with her girlfriend and her girlfriend's mother on a train towards Warsaw. When they were getting towards Warsaw, my heart, so her parents had layered her in many layers of clothing, not knowing what was going to happen, but hoping that she would get further away from the Nazis approaching the city. They were not going to leave because of the elderly relatives and such a big family, but they wanted my mother to try to get away with her friend and her friend's mother. At this check stop entering Warsaw, my mother said she knew that she had diamonds sewn into her girdle because her parents had done that in case she needed something to bribe the Nazis with later. So she had all these layers of clothing and they had a checkpoint where they said, we are going to check you. We're going to strip you down. We're going to check your clothing. And if we find jewels that you haven't turned over to the Nazis, we're going to kill you or take you away. My mother was nervous. She wasn't sure what to do. So she kept trying to dally the process of being checked until finally it was almost lunchtime when she got up to the women guards who were going to check her. Fortunately, they were getting hungry. And my mother said to them, here she was. It was, um, you know, she was born in 21 and this is, um, 39. And she said to the ladies, just as they were examining her, oh, I really have to go to the bathroom. Can you please hurry up? It's almost lunchtime. And the women just patted her down and didn't strip her and didn't find the diamonds. But my mother went to the restroom and she cut open her girdle and she flushed the diamonds away because she did not want to get killed for having the diamonds. And she didn't want the Nazis to get the diamonds. She thought to herself, I can't do this away from my family. It's very nice that these people are fleeing east, trying to escape the Nazis. But whatever is going to happen, I want to be with my parents. I want to be with my extended family. I want to help out my younger sister, who's five years younger. My family needs me. And so she got, told her girlfriend and her girlfriend's mother, I can't stay with you. She took off her armband got onto a train and headed back to Ludge. She arrives in Ludge after curfew. The building that her parents lived in was already occupied by Germans and had a German flag flying above it, the apartment house. She says to the guards who stopped her at the train in her German, ah, this train is late because of these stupid Jews or whatever. I need to get to that apartment building down the street and um, I'm sorry it's after curfew, but please let me pass. And she was attractive. She was five foot eight. She had a very strong sense of herself. And they let her go back to the, they let her go to the apartment. She knocks on the door. Her parents are scared. Somebody's knocking on the door. 
They open it and her mother screams, I thought you were safe. I thought you were going east. And my mother just fell into her parents' arms and said, whatever's going to happen, I need to be here with you at home together. So from then on, she was in the Ludge Ghetto from 1940 to 1944, from the very beginning till the very last transport. What was her life like in the ghetto? She was very lucky. She got a job working as a nurse in the hospital. This was a good job to have because it was indoors, there was food, there was medicine, and sometimes you could smuggle things out for your family. And she got trained to be a nurse at the hospital, it was a children's hospital mostly, within the ghetto. The ghettoization was amazing. The Nazis, you know, put a number of, like what we call the Judenrat, created a council of elders to run the ghetto. Chaim Romkowski was the head of the Ludge Ghetto. He had run an orphanage. He was an older gentleman. And um, my mother's uncle had a wood factory within the ghetto because Ludge was a big textile um, city, kind of like Pittsburgh. And they had a lot of factories within the ghetto. And the Nazis needed the people in the factories and the textiles and the wood to help with the war effort for Germany. So if you could work, everybody was registered, if you could work within the ghetto and you had a, a job, even though they took your apartment away and they moved you together with many families creating cold and difficult conditions so that people would get sick and die, those who were strong and who could work and had a job had a better chance of surviving. And fortunately, my mother and her family started off in that situation. When my mother was working in the in the hospital, the Nazis would do sweeps where they would start to take away those who were older, those who were younger, and as each year went by, they were trying to only have the viable workers staying in the ghetto. But fortunately, most of my mother's family all had jobs and were able to stay busy and be able to work. Now in so in January 15, 1940, my mother's uncle and aunt had a baby, Elona. And that baby was in the ghetto the whole time. And whenever there was a sweep, my mother would take her to the hospital and hide her where the Nazis had already cleared out children. And so this child did wind up surviving these four years in the ghetto with her parents. My mother's mother, unfortunately, in 1942, got sick. And they did a procedure to try to help her within the ghetto. Now, the ghetto created its own support system. They created a way for people to have food and share food. They created their own um, police force and their own fire force and the factories and trying to teach and trying to um, still have education. The most important thing was to clean up the bodies that died and make sure that they could bury them. And, and the whole ghetto functioned as its own little city within a city. But in this ghetto, it was really cut off from the non-Jews. You had to literally go up and across a bridge to go in and out of the city and it was surrounded with barbed wire. There's actually a replica of it at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum of the Ludge Ghetto or the Littmanstadt Ghetto. Um, my mother worked in this hospital until they closed the hospitals. In 42, when her mother got sick, her mother did not make it. And so her mother died in the ghetto in 42. You know, you think of your grandparent as being like an old lady with a bun, but my grandmother was only 46 when she died in the ghetto. And what surprised my mother was how devastated her father was. My mother was very close to her father. She saw her father as a very strong man who adored and loved his wife and the family. And she had many philosophical and interesting talks with her dad. And she knew her dad adored and loved his wife, but she couldn't believe how devastated he was when her mother died. And so my mother took on the role of supporting him emotionally and her sister, who Stefcha, who was five years younger, in terms of making sure they had food and making sure that they were taken care of. 
And the Nazis put the Jews in apartments, not where they were originally, but they crowded them into the worst part of the city with many more people, where it was cold, where they didn't have that much food, they had to ration. And the idea was to kill as many as people as they could before they even got to the point of transports and the final solution. In 43, we know that by 40, the end of 41, 42, after the Vonsi conference, the Nazis did come up with the system of the concentration camps and the killing centers. So you had ghettos, you had concentration camps, and then you had the camps where they actually gassed and killed many of the Jews. But the idea was to rid the world of Jews, every man, woman, and child who was Jewish, was Hitler's goal to eliminate from this world. It's just impossible to comprehend that really not that long ago, and in, in the lifetime of my mother who just passed away at the age of 98, that this barbaric behavior could have come out of a place like Germany, which also produced great philosophers, artists, musicians, and food. My father, in fact, my grandfather, in fact, always admired, as my mother did, the efficiency of the Germans. And um, when it came to the war, they were very efficient, unfortunately. So my mother, after her job at the um, hospital was discontinued, she got a job in her uncle's wood factory. And because she was good with numbers too, she was helping with the accounting and like I said, also helping her father and her sister and her friends survive. And they got through the next couple of years being in the Lodge Ghetto. In August of 44, by then they already had transported many children and many elderly out of the ghetto. And it was because in Lodge, they did not realize what was happening outside of that ghetto. There was no communication to know about the camps, to know about Auschwitz. They figured if you worked, you were valuable. And when they took transports out of the ghetto, they told the people they're taking them to the country where there was more food, on farms where they were using them as workers. So people did not know that they really were being killed, even though we know today what was really happening. So in the last transport out of the Ludge ghetto, my mother was on the train with Chaim Romkowski and her father and her sister, and they were headed for Auschwitz. Her uncle, who had the wood factory, was allowed to keep 500, was among the 500 who were kept back in the ghetto to clean it up. And my, her, the cousin who was born in the ghetto, who had the little girl, Ilona, her parents begged their brother to let them stay too because they didn't know what a transport was going to mean. And so Ludwig, who ran the wood factory, he had a wife, a son, and a daughter, and he kept them in the ghetto, and he kept his other brother with his wife and little girl in the ghetto, but he couldn't keep my mother and her father and sister there, unfortunately. And my mother had was debating with her father, should we hide and stay in the ghetto and be with the other relatives even though they couldn't officially keep us in the 500 or should we go on the transport? And sadly, her father said, if we're valuable and we can be workers, what's going to happen? And so unfortunately, in fact, my mother had a boyfriend at the time and she said the boyfriend was urging them to hide and not go on the transport. But her father prevailed in talking them into going on the transport. Late at night, they arrive in this place that we know now as Auschwitz. And my mother says she thought they sent her to an insane asylum. She looked at the people with the striped uniforms and the gaunt faces and the shaved heads and the soot was overhead and the Nazi said, that's where you're going to be. And she just couldn't comprehend that they were burning bodies and that they were gassing and burning bodies of Jews and others, but mostly the Jews. It was also, um, it was homosexuals. It was Jehovah witnesses, seven day Adventists and anyone who rebelled against them. But the biggest population, every Jew was a target 
but they had selection when you arrived in Auschwitz. And my mother was with her sister, and she never saw her father again. So my grandfather perished in, in Auschwitz or nearby, as far as we know. My mother and her sister were stripped naked, and for five days, they were just trying to decide what, what to do, whether they were going to be sent to the, sh I mean, the Nazis were trying to decide whether they were healthy enough to be sent one to another camp. My mother says, can you imagine being in your late teens and being raised modest and being stripped naked and having your head shaved? They weren't given tattoos. This was already getting into the early fall of 44. And unbeknownst to my mother, the Russians were approaching and the Nazis really were beginning to lose the war. They, the woman who shaved my mother's head said to her, you don't look Jewish. Maybe I can send you over to the Polish camp with the Polish prisoners. You'll have a better chance to survive. And my mother said, I'm with my sister and I'm with my cousins and I'm with some friends. I can't do that. I have to stay with my sister. And so she and her sister, after five days in Auschwitz, were then sent to Stutthof. My mother tells me this interesting story about when she survived, when she arrived in Auschwitz. She said a young man who recognized her from normal times said to her, Irka, Irka, what can I do for you? Can I get you an extra bowl of soup or can I get you soap? Well, my mother saw during working in the hospital and under the conditions that were created by the Nazis, that staying clean was essential to not getting typhus or typhoid fever. And she felt soap was more important than soup. And she said that she tried to carry her toothbrush with her the whole time. And she said to this young man, if you can get me soap, I would so appreciate it. She and her sister were sent to the showers, but they came out having been sent to real showers where they were shaved, where they were blasting them with stuff for the lice and shaving their head. Um, and after five days in Auschwitz, they were sent to Stutthof concentration camp. If you look at a map of Poland, Stutthof is in the upper right-hand corner of Poland. It's a, it's a camp right near the Baltic Sea. And actually, my father was across the way in Kaiserwald, and then eventually in Stutthof, they crossed paths, but they didn't know each other yet. My father was from Riga, Latvia, and the war entered his city in 1941. And I'll tell you more about what he went through in just a minute. So my mother was in Stutthof. In February or March, her sister and she got typhus. They were so sick. So many people were dying from the, situ from the conditions of being crowded in the barracks, from the lice. They were put to work as sewers but the disease was overtaking so much of the population. Well, by February or March of 45, the Nazis knew they were losing the war and they wanted to do, have everybody who was remaining go on the death march back towards Germany, hoping that, they would, that most of the victims would die so there wouldn't be eyewitnesses to what the Nazis had put the Jews through. My mother thought this is, she was too weak to go on a death march and her sister was absolutely dying from typhus. Her sister's legs were all swollen. Her sister could barely move. And she said to her friends, I'm not going on a death march. I'm going to be here with my sister. She was recuperating, but her sister was not. And her friends followed my mother. My mother was like a natural leader. She, was, she had a strong sense of authority. She was put in charge of the barracks before they got sick. And she was asked to divide up the food evenly. And she was very fair that way. And... She said to the friends, you know, they said they're going to burn the camp. Let them, let them just burn us here because we're too weak to go walk in the winter through the woods. So she stayed with her sister in Stutthof. And sure enough, her sister by March, sort of like Anne Frank and her sister who were in um, a different camp, her sister died in her arms. And she felt that, that she, she had to live with herself with any decision she made during the war. She said, even though it was wartime and you didn't have a lot of choice, the one choice you did have, no matter where you were in life, was how you conducted yourself. And she felt she couldn't live with herself if she made it, if she were not by her sister's side when her sister died. So her sister dies. 
And her friends say to her, we'll be like sisters. We will be like sisters. We will stick together. And so in April of 45, when the war was just about over, the Russians had already gotten to Auschwitz in January and were starting to liberate many different camps. But where she was, the Nazis decided they're going to put the remaining victims on a boat in the Baltic. For five days, she's on this ship, and they're going to take them back to Germany, and they're going to then blow up the boat, but they were going to let off POWs or the Nazis who had stayed behind. When they said they were going to burn the camp, it turned out that the guards didn't want to go on the death march either, and since there were still some remaining victims, they used it as an excuse to stay in Stutthof, and then when they went onto the ship, they were on the ship without food or water for five days. And she was very close to Frida and Losha, who were her um, very good friends. Dorka, excuse me, Frida and Dorka. And they went on the ship together. And when they landed in Norstadt Holstein, my mother said she doesn't even know how she could stand. No food or water for five days on this ship. But they could see lights in the houses on the shore. And somehow she and Frida and Dorka got to a house and they knocked on the door and they said to the woman that they could, did she have any bread or any tea? The woman could see these emaciated victims and said to them, the war's just about over. The Red Cross is already in our village. I will take you to the Red Cross so that you can and turn you over to them. It looks like you need food, water, hospitalization. She started to take them to the city and the Nazis came in, rounded them up again and were marching them back to the ship to put them on the ship and blow the ship up. At this ninth hour, to my mother's amazement, the British arrived and suddenly the Nazis scattered and the British said, the war is over, you are free. My mother said, you didn't know what that was even going to mean. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And so the British liberated my mother and she said there were other Jews who also were on the shore who were being taken back to the ship to be blown up. And they took these victims to a hospital. My mother said that in the hospital, the doctor said, how old do you think she is? I mean, she looks like she's in her 60s. And my mother said, I'm 23. And they just couldn't believe how the war had aged her and how awful she looked. And she wasn't sure she was going to make it because her stomach wouldn't keep any food down. But she said, finally, after six weeks, oatmeal, which she says is the go-to food whenever you're going through any kind of deprivation or any kind of stomach problem. Finally, with oatmeal and the care of these doctors, she did survive. But here she was alone. Where should she go? What should she do? She didn't know. Imagine before computers how lists were being published all over the place of the survivors. And somehow she found out that her uncle, who had the wood factory, and only his daughter and Alona and her parents had survived. They had been sent to Sachsenhausen and Ravensbrück. And her uncle Ludovic's wife and son did not make it, but his daughter did, who was also a few years younger than my mother. And they were going back to Poland to see what was, what was happening with their former apartments. They sent a message that she should come and join them. But she didn't want to go back to Poland. She didn't really want to be with them. She wasn't sure what she wanted to do. So with her friends, she remained in Germany, and they put her in a displaced person's house. Well, lucky for me, at the displaced person's house, she needed dental work because of what had happened from being deprived of nutrition during the war. So they filed down her front teeth to make um, front teeth for her because her teeth had rotted because of the conditions during the war. And she was embarrassed. And this handsome man said to her at dinner at this displaced person's house, she's now in Hanover, Germany. Why are you covering your mouth while you're having dinner like this? 
And my mother said, because I don't have my front teeth. And this man named Gilbert first said, take your hand away. You're beautiful with or without your teeth. And he said, are you with someone? And she said, no. And he started courting her and telling her his story. My father was born in 1911 in Riga, Latvia. He lost his mother when he was four years old. And he went through World War I, the Russian Revolution, and then World War II and the Holocaust. He was one of seven children. His mother died in childbirth after, when the next child after him was born. But he had two older brothers and two older sisters who helped raise him. And then his father remarried and he had a stepmother. He was from a lower middle class family. His father was a machinist. And my father was a wonderful, was wonderful with his hands. And he turned out to be wonderful as a mechanic or a machinist as well. Because of the wars and the revolution, his education was interrupted several times. So he only finished the equivalent formally of about eighth grade. And then he went to work as a machinist for the, with the family, with his father. And when, before World War II happened, he was married with two children by then. He was 10 years older than my mother. He was in the Riga ghetto, which was entered in 1941. Anyone who was a mechanic or good at, as a factory worker was very valuable to the Nazis. And so my father was actually a metal worker. If you saw Schindler's List, they said, say you're a metal worker, not a professional, because metal workers were needed. Well, my father really was a metal worker. He could fix cars. He could fix motorcycles. He could work in any factory. And so he was valuable to them. He also had a knack for languages. So not only was he fluent in Russian, but also he picked up German during the occupation. And so he was always a valuable worker. Unfortunately, when he was sent to Kaiserwald to work, they took all the women and children telling the workers that they were taking them to the woods so they would have better food and better conditions. He found out later, as most of the men did, that the women and children were murdered. He had two little boys and a wife who were all killed. He said when he found this out, he wanted to commit suicide. And he actually, somebody had access to some pills, and he said he took them. The Nazis pumped his stomach and said, you're a valuable machinist. We'll tell you when you're ready to die. We need you right now. So this was the inconsistency about the Nazis way of treating their victims. You never knew from day to day whether you were going to be someone chosen to die or someone chosen to live. As I said, he was across the Baltic from Stutthof, and he wound up being sent to Stutthof. Didn't know my mom then, but he was there with his brother. And then from there to Buchenwald, and then he was on the death march with his brother, and they made it to Germany. And in Germany, before he met my mother, he was actually in Berlin. And he didn't know it. He was thinking about going back to Russia. And he met some Americans who said, do not go back to Russia. They will treat you as though you were a collaborator, even though the Nazis made you work for them. And right now, you're in the wrong part of Berlin. You need to go into the other side because they're going to divide the city into the east, the communist side, and the free side. So he and his brother literally didn't even go back to where they had been staying because they didn't want to get caught in the wrong zone. And fortunately, we're in the right part of Berlin when it was divided um, after the war. Then he was sent to the displaced person's house in Hanover where he met my mom. Well, this wasn't the end of this, their adventure. This was the beginning of the next stage of their lives. They fell in love and they were together. And my father knew he had relatives in the United States. And he told the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, Hyas, to try to find his aunt and his cousin who were in Baltimore. But at the same time, he was approached by the Israelis, the, they, were, they were the Palestinian Jews, because it wasn't Israel yet, who wanted to take workers and people who wanted to go to the future state of Israel to Israel, even though it was illegal. So he and my mother decided they wanted to go to a ship in Marseille and go to Palestine, just like the story of Exodus. 
So after, so they prepared for that. My mother and my father, they weren't married yet, but they decided to do this. And they were taken in trucks down from Germany through France to try to get to this ship. And then they were going to be under the other um, passengers and cargo and be taken to what was Palestine that was going to be Israel. On their journey, the Jewish brigade had thought they had paid off a lot of the guards so that these trucks could get through and make it to the ship. But their guard betrayed them and sent their trucks back to Germany. So when they got back to Germany, they checked in with Hyas and they found out that the relatives of my, my father's relatives in Baltimore had made papers for them to come to America and agreed to sponsor them. So my father, the, the clerk who told them said to my father, I think it's time for you to marry this beautiful woman because she can go in your quota. They literally went to the justice of the peace it happened to be my mother's birthday, October 1st, and they got married in 1946, October 1st, in Germany, in Hanover. They made papers. They agreed to go to the United States and be sponsored by their relatives here. It still took a while. It was 46, and they didn't wind up getting on a ship until they arrived on the USS Ernie Powell, June 22nd, 1947, in New York. Uh, relatives of my father, his his aunt's daughter lived in New York and greeted them beautifully in New York. Could not they lived in a one room, a one bedroom apartment in the Bronx, but welcomed my parents, treated them with open arms, had them sleep in their apartment, took them to Radio City Music Hall, showed them New York, took them shopping for clothes, and really treated them with love and dignity. And my parents were very lucky because not all American relatives knew what to expect of their European relatives. They didn't know where they were coming from and didn't know that what to expect. And it turned out that, you know, my father and my mother were treated very nicely when they arrived. But since they were sponsored by relatives in Baltimore, they had to go to Baltimore. And so this cousin of my father and her husband, everybody was going down to Baltimore because there was a bar mitzvah that was going to be happening in Baltimore of this cousin's nephew. And so everyone went to Baltimore and my parents settled in Baltimore. There was a very big survivor community in, part in Baltimore and most of their friends wound up being survivors. And the family that lived there really embraced us. Um, my cousin, in fact, her birthday is today. Her parents were the sponsors and my parents lived in their house for a while and then they got their own place. And with my father being a good mechanic, he went to work for Park, Park Circle Chevrolet as a body mechanic, and he stayed in that job his entire career in Baltimore. They had me in 48. I have a brother, two brothers. One's five years younger, one's seven years younger. So my father, into his late 30s, into his 40s, had a second family. And we had, fortunately, because of these relatives and these cousins, they really tried to give us as normal a life as we could in Baltimore. It was a modest life, but it was lovely during the 50s and the 60s to grow up there. I was very fortunate to have these relatives and to have parents who were strong and inspiring. And the family that we had in Baltimore tried to take the place of those that my parents lost. My father passed away when he was 80 from cancer. And when he was dying, his final words to me were, the last 50 years were a gift. I never thought I'd see, I'd live, I'd have three more children and have your beautiful mother as my wife and have friends and be able to afford a house and a wedding for you and give you the life that was modest, but that was full of love and um, commitment and friends. And I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate to have two wonderful parents who raised me and my brothers. My mother, then after my father died, moved to Pittsburgh. And so she was living here since 99 for 20 years. And just this past November 30th, at the age of 98, she passed away. When she came here, because of being the director of the Holocaust Center, all the survivors embraced her and loved her. They actually knew her and my dad because they used to come and visit regularly from Baltimore. And um, 
My mother was teaching people to the very end about her background, about her history. She still could sing in Polish. She still could recite poems in Polish. She had the most amazing memory, and she knew the survivors in Pittsburgh and spoke to many, many, many groups. The last time she actually spoke to a really big group was at Shady Side Academy about two years ago with me. Even in Maxon Towers, where she lived, Barbara Burston would bring groups to hear her tell her story. And then when she was now in Weinberg Village, she was always talking about her story to the caretakers and to the, the workers there and asking them to share their stories and their background as well. She had a very open mind and a very big heart, was very strong. And I miss her, but she... She gave me an enormous foundation of strength, both my parents did. Linda, oh my goodness, um, that is so powerful, everything that you said. So, I mean, we, we have questions in mind that we normally ask, but some things came up um, in your telling of your parents' incredible stories that I want us to follow up on because we have an incredible opportunity in a conversation with you, a very experienced and committed Holocaust educator, um, to look a little bit more closely at, at some things that are really important for our understanding of what happened in the Holocaust. Um, and also, I'm going to take the opportunity to hear from you a little bit more about the survivor community of Pittsburgh when we had hundreds of survivors because that's a very special thing that people who are getting involved with us now really don't understand about our local history. So um, first, and then we'll go on to a couple more things I want to ask you. But um, one thing that I thought of a lot while you were telling the story, especially as, as your mother showed a real commitment to her family and her friends and to community, is one thing that you and I talk about, which is choiceless choices. And I wonder if you could just explain what we mean when we say choiceless choices and reflect a little bit on how, how that plays into the decisions that your mother was making really throughout her many years in the Lodge Ghetto and after. Right. Yeah, that constantly came up. I might, there's so many, I learned a lot, and I think a lot of children and survivors, and probably a lot of people in their lives, learn about their parents through anecdotes. You know, they don't like tell you a straight history. And so she told a lot through stories, like in the ghetto, when she was working as a nurse, she tells a story of having to cross a bridge where a Nazi was drunk and thought it was fun to just do target practice by shooting down different people. And this thing about choiceless choices, the sense of dignity she had of pulling herself together and facing the Nazis, to her she said, if you could be composed and face them strongly, they respected you more, and it worked for her a number of times in her situation. So she said to the soldier, I have to pass, I'm a nurse, I work at that hospital. Just like when she got off the train and went back to her home and said, oh, you know, pretended she wasn't Jewish. And so she said she, she conducted herself that way a lot of times, like should she go across the bridge, should she go back and not go to work? but she felt she tried to maintain normalcy and make choices of strength. Now, you never knew where the decisions were going to take you. She was lucky. She, got, she was able to pass. Um, he let her go through. Um, likewise, when, she, um, when, when her boyfriend said, maybe we should hide and stay and not go, and you don't know, should you hide? and stay behind. She was a little angry with her uncle for not including them in the numbers he was able to keep for the, for the cleanup squad of the ghetto, not knowing where they were going to be going, but they were all sent west, it turned out, and mostly survived, whereas she's the only one who did survive being sent east. But nobody really knew at that point what that was going to mean. But still, she was upset with her uncle, who was um, you know, who owned this factory, who apparently had a pretty good relationship with the Nazi who was the commander of the, of the, of the ghetto. But anyway, again, she wound up feeling guilty that the boyfriend died going with her to Auschwitz. So these choiceless choices create what we call survivor guilt. That even though she had no way to know and she shouldn't feel it, she told me for years she felt terrible 
that he went with her and her family and he didn't make it. But, you know, they shouldn't feel guilty. They didn't know where each decision was going to take them. But you are left with that. Um, trying to think some other choiceless choices. You had to make decisions and, and they were both difficult because they both could lead to death or life and you just didn't know why you were making that. And that happens in life, in normal life as well, but especially in that situation when constantly what job you took made a difference you know, um, who you knew made a difference. Let's face it, street smarts made a difference. You didn't want to operate that way. But in those situations, having some street savvy was very important. Who you knew, who you could, like, like taking the diamonds. Her parents didn't know really where she was going, but gave her that thinking she could bribe somebody. But of course, she was afraid at that point of getting killed. So she got rid of the diamonds, you know, and she went back home. And her mother had said, don't come back home, but she's glad she did. Um, you just don't know. And then when she, her sister was dying, that she didn't go on the death march, you know, not knowing which choice. But she said, you have to make a decision based on what you think you can live with, no matter what the circumstances are. And she was raised, like I said, with, by her father, who had a very strong sense of ethics and right and wrong. So you didn't need formal religion. You just had to, I'll give you an example after the war. She got a job in Baltimore working in a lady's dress shop. Now this is relevant to what we're dealing with today with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. In the dress shop, blacks and whites could shop, but a black woman wanted to try something on. And the owner of the shop told my mother, you can't let her try it on here because if a white person sees it, they might not support my shop. And my mother turned to him and said, I just survived the Holocaust. I am not telling somebody they can't try on a dress because of the color of their skin. You can tell them yourself or I'm quitting. And so she had a very strong sense, both my parents did, about treating everyone with dignity, no matter their color, no matter their religion, no matter what. And I lived in the 60s in Baltimore. And when there were the marches in Washington, I was very... Um, you know, involved during the time of integration in Baltimore. And I, because of my parents, I didn't want them hurt. So I didn't go to Washington for the march because I knew they were worried about something happening to me. But emotionally, I, we felt, our family felt very aligned with the, with the need for fairness and choices and changes. I'm glad you brought that up because this is really the issue that has been front and center. You know, we are all quarantined or not, but maybe we should be, but we're responding still to this novel coronavirus, which has introduced a lot of uncertainty for many of us and mm -hmm. also terrible times for many of us. At the same time now, we've had nearly two months of protests for Black Lives Matter. So you're talking about the 1960s. Here we are in 2020 and we're still I'm talking facing about 1947 when my mother was working in the store in Baltimore and saying, I'm not going to tell this black woman she can't put something on. Yeah. So we're talking about more than 70 years ago in your right. own family's experience yeah. dealing with an issue that is still with us very much today. Um, I don't know if you know how your mother felt about this continuing in the United States or what you think your knowledge of the Holocaust, you're being the daughter of two survivors, what perspective that gives you on what's happening now? Well, I know my mother felt very strongly that everyone should be treated equally. And she worked for H&R. She stayed home with us um, till we were in high school. And then she got, because she had this background of being very good in math, she, she got trained by H&R Block to be a tax preparer, which she thought would be a really nice thing to do because a couple months a year you're working a lot, but you're not working all the time. Um, she started speaking in high schools already when I was in college because they were looking for someone who could speak, and she started doing that. But she also worked for H&R Block for 25 years with all different people of different backgrounds and different colors and different teachers. And, and Baltimore is definitely a city where integration was happening in the 60s, and they were very supportive of treating people fairly. I mean, my high school gradually was turning um, – there were middle-class black families who were – sending their kids. And I was a cheerleader in high school with a Jewish football boyfriend. <laughs> and we, and on, the, and on our squad, we were half black and half white, but we, you know, we respected each other and, um, you know, we got along fine. And my family did not do the white flight thing of moving to the suburbs. They stayed living 
in the city and same with my husband's family. We're both from Baltimore. So, um, you know, certainly my family felt that it was very important for fairness to be um, an option and that they couldn't understand how long these mistreat the mis mistreatment went on. And, you know, we certainly witnessed the demonstrations that occurred in the 60s in Baltimore with the, with the killing of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and that whole era of, and, you know, the 68 election. I mean, I was, you know, I was in my early 20s through all of that, you know, late teens, early 20s through all of that. So it's been a very strong um, awareness. And I think being a child of Holocaust survivors, I think the survivors felt very strongly. When you talk about the survivors, when I was director and there was a lot of shootings going on in Wilkinsburg, I took a group of Holocaust survivors, Jackson Smyrna, a lot of others who were alive at the time, and we did a discussion with the teenagers in Wilkinsburg who were losing friends. And the survivors were sharing with them how they saw their friends be killed, and they were teenagers. They were 14, 15, 16, and the Nazis were killing their family and their friends. And here they were as adults who made it through. And they were trying to inspire the kids not to give up, that you can get through the pain, that you should, yourself should not be part of the violence, but that people lose people and you have to find the strength in yourself to keep going on even with the mistreatment. So I, that was one of the highlights. I loved when we went there and did this dialogue with the black community. Actually being part, when my job as director of the Holocaust Center included being part of the black Jewish dialogue when I first took my job. And, and we're reviving that kind of role for the Holocaust Center as we have been over the past four years building relationships in communities of color. Right. And we, we also see very strongly that we have a lot in common. Right. You know, there's, we can listen to each other and support each other. And it seems even more urgent right now with everything that's happening. There's also a, a need to clarify some misunderstandings in the black community about Jewish history in the past. And you can't do a sweeping generalization about any group. You know, there were, there were relationships and leadership in the Jewish community, and there were other activities that weren't quite so admirable, but the same thing in the black community. And so that's why you need to look at it from the bigger picture. I'm so glad you said that, because this is something that, again, you know, if we're reflecting on what's in the news right now, this is exactly the situation we're in. We had, we've had almost two months of protests after the killing of George Floyd, and now we've had some prominent people, athletes and entertainers, posting anti-Semitic tropes, something that you mentioned earlier in telling the story, posting anti-Semitic tropes to millions of social media followers. So it's very serious and it's incorrect. So, I mean, at the Holocaust Center, it put me in a position anyway to articulate our commitment to being an anti-racist organization, which I would right. say is 100% commitment. At the same time, we are completely against anti-Semitism wherever we see it. Right. We're going to call it out. We're going to speak up about it. And um, I believe strongly, it's not easy, but I believe strongly that we have to be both of these things. So, I mean, you're 100% right that there is anti-Semitism in communities where we see a natural alliance and we need to work through that. And there is racism really close to home and we need to work through that too. And yeah. um, it, it's a confusing and difficult time, but anytime there is this kind of urgency, it's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity for the Holocaust Center. I regret that I wasn't here for those times when you could take survivors to Wilkinsburg. About how many, how many survivors would you say were active with the Holocaust Center in the past? Um, well, when I, we had a couple, we had several hundred survivors in Pittsburgh. And the core of those who were really active, really active was probably, 50 to 100 in terms of being on committees and being involved in speaking and admit not, not more than 50 actually were active speakers, probably even less than that. There was like certain people that were very comfortable telling their story and they did it frequently. And then we kept trying to bring more people into that as they retired or as they had the time or, you know, if they went with somebody else, just like you're doing with the children of survivors. Um, but yeah, it was. But and then people who were willing to like candles at Yoma Showa maybe and just speak briefly. But other people who really would go to schools or churches or colleges and and speak. And I took them as far east as probably Altoona, 
and uh, State College and as far south as Buchanan, West Virginia and as far into Ohio as like Kent State in that area, you know, but then, I mean, every community was trying to identify its own survivors, but we had a, a core of people who would travel and, and speak out. And then when we had that program, Action Reconciliation Service for Peace, where we had the young volunteers from Germany, people like Fritz and German Jews who had come in the 30s, who weren't quite sure if they called themselves survivors or not, but we do, they realized that there was a validity, a very important message that they had to share about what happened in Germany in the 30s, the pushing, the, the, the marginalizing of the Jews and the loss of democracy is one of the most important lessons that we can learn from the Holocaust, not just the horrors, but really what happened to, in Germany in the 30s is critical to understand because it's your leadership, it's who you vote for, it's the laws, it's how the government runs itself along with the people. And that's critical even now with what's happening to be a, um, a participatory voter and care about your country and your, your government at every level. I want to take us back to your parents and your experience growing up with your parents, um, what you learned from them, um, how it has shaped the person that you are, and, um, and also how you cope with telling your family's story, which you told so beautifully. Thank you. As I started off saying, I am, was always proud of having my parents be survivors. I mean, it was funny when friends who were American would say, where are they from because of their accents? And my brothers and I would go, they're from Baltimore. No, but I mean, I heard the accents. My brothers even less so because as more time passed, their, their English became, you know, better. But I was used to being surrounded by accents. Their strength and resilience, they, as, as I said, they didn't want to overemphasize the Holocaust years at all. My mother talked about her life before the war, about her grandparents and her extended family. I would come home and she'd be ironing and she'd talk a lot about her family before. And my father did not talk about it much at all. They wanted us to be American. And only when I started reading about, you know, I was an, I was an English teacher actually by background. So when I started avidly reading my meal at 18 and the wall and all these books related to the Holocaust, then it was a stepping stone to ask my mother and my father more and more questions. My father usually didn't want to talk about it that much. So I knew that. One of the critical things that was interesting is this cousin of mine whose birthday is today, who sponsored my parents to come. When I was about 11, she had two older sisters. So the older sisters knew my parents' story firsthand from when they had first arrived. And they were like 10 and 12 years older than we are. So they told my cousin a lot of the stories that my parents told her. My cousin, I was sleeping at her house one day and she said, did you ever ask your dad about his first family? And I went, what? I didn't know that he had this first family that was killed because he didn't want me burdened by what he had lost. And who thinks about your parents' age or the fact that my dad was 10 years older than my mother? He was my father and I had to, you know, this was my family. He didn't think about it and he didn't talk about it. I was afraid to ask my dad about the loss. I went to my mother and she confirmed that he had had this wife and children. And then later on in life, you know, finally he did start to talk to me. But when I recorded my mother's story in the fall of 89 at the Holocaust Center, my father sat outside and he wouldn't do an interview. He did do an interview finally for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum as a survivor of the Riga ghetto. But he wouldn't do it for Pittsburgh when I did my mother's story with Jack Gordon, which we have on file and you can access online at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, my dad just didn't want to talk about it. And, you know, you felt like you didn't want to put him through the pain, but I really wish I knew more. I mean, I, he, a brother survived with him who came to America. He had lost a wife and a child, too. Um, when you think about how much he, he lived through, losing a mother, the Russian Revolution, constant upheaval with World War I, and then finally he's married with kids, and then World War II, and then the Holocaust, and then being in Germany, trying to get to, I mean, so he was so strong and inspirational. Now, my years growing up, he always talked to me. He was very close to me. He talked to me about life and about people and about values. 
and um, he was very strong. And the survive and my parents' strength. Fortunately, I feel that I was lucky to get the inspiration of their strengths when I had my own tragedy. And um, the worst time in my life was when I had to call my parents who had now adjusted to American life, who had their friends, who played cards, who had me and my brothers. And my first child, sadly, was murdered here in Pittsburgh, um, October 27th, 1989. But when I had to call and tell my parents that their first grandchild was murdered, at 17 and a half years old, that was the hardest phone call I've ever made in my life. Because I felt like I was bringing them pain again to relive what they had gone through. But my father and my mother said, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. And my father said, that's all I know is a cycle of love and loss and resilience and pain. And you, you'll get through it. And, you know, you will laugh again and you will dance again and you'll have life again. But you know, you have to get through it. Nobody can really help you. You just have to work your way through it. And um, seeing that, knowing that they had done that gave me a lot of strength and they were right. They were right. And it's ironic that we were my father's second family and then my husband and I wound up having a second family. So there's some kind of cycle. I don't know why in my family, but um, knowing the survivors here, knowing the survivors I knew growing up, knowing how much they all had suffered and had losses, but kept picking themselves up and going on. I think for our time right now, to me, anything I'm going through in life, it's never as bad as the Holocaust. It's my touchstone for suffering. It's not that we don't all suffer with losses. We do, but it's not the Holocaust. I mean, even now that we, you know, we have technology, we have food. I'm worried about lots of people going through very hard times financially and so forth. But it's still not a war. It's not like being in the war from, you know, what they all had to go through. And if they could go through that and survive it, we, we will survive whatever we have to go through now, too. Oh, yes. I mean, the survivors, for anyone who's lucky enough to be around survivors and befriend them and love them and learn from them, which I've been lucky enough to do for going on 25 years. Right. Yes. I mean, it, we do learn from them that you can survive the worst thing that you can imagine and get on with your life. And Linda, I can't thank you enough for sharing that, that personal part of your own story, which, uh, which I remember. I remember because I knew your family then. And um, I mean, it, it was really such a horrific loss and that you went on from that and you have your second family and you have taught so many people and you're such an important member of the community. Um, I feel lucky to know you and so inspired by you. And I really just cannot thank you enough for being with us today. Thank you, thank Linda. You.